introduction to the poetry of thomas moore this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by noel badrian poetry of thomas moore selected and arranged by c lytton falconer to realize that the vogue of moore among his contemporaries was second only to the vogue of byron and the vogue of scott requires something like an effort of the historical imagination yet so it certainly was and not only so but by virtue of the rapidity with which his early fame was achieved the irish poet who had made his mark before either of his great coevals had become widely known was for a long time considered their equal never during his life was he ranked in any lower grade than theirs the senior by nine years of byron anacreon moore was a celebrity in the salons of london before the author of hours of idleness had left harrow and although junior to scott by almost as many years moore had published three separate volumes and had acquired a definite hold upon the public before the lay of the last minstrel had appeared that hold upon the public moore retained to the end of his career despite the extraordinary poetic fertility of the period in which he lived no doubt moore owed much of his sustained eminence to the circumstance that in the great poetical tournament which the nineteenth century opened he was the first to enter the lists as scott good-humouredly said to him speaking of their numerous competitors we were in the luck of it to come before these fellows whom we have taught to beat us with our own weapons yet the fact remains that despite the advent of the immortal band of moderns of byron and shelley of wordsworth and keats moore contrived to command to the close of a long career the unstinted applause of his contemporaries that the praise thus bestowed on moore was excessive hardly requires demonstration if we take the most prosaic standard of merit possible the standard of a publisher's appraisement of a writer's market value we shall find irrespective of all literary canons of criticism a sufficient proof of it no one considers nor did any one even in the acme of moore's popularity pretend to consider lala rook the greatest poem which was produced in the extraordinarily fertile age in which it was written yet longmans were willing to give the largest sum ever paid for a single poem for the right to publish lala rook and that without seeing a line of the work the natural enthusiasm of biographers provides a standard classification even less trustworthy than that of the publishers the eminent statesman whom moore was indiscreet enough to name as his literary executor raised to the memory of his friend a monument of all that biography ought not to be and even apart from the biographical infelicity the critical authority of lord john russell does not stand high but at any rate he was warm and sincere in his appreciation of his friend and when he claims for the author of the irish melodies that of lyrical poets moore is surely the first if he cannot command our assent at least he expresses a view which was held three-quarters of a century ago by some excellent judges of poetry nor is it certain that he was wrong in adding that in the united excellence and abundance of his lyrical productions no english poet can be compared with moore for the body of moore's lyrical poems is unusually large and their average excellence singularly well sustained if the poet does not often soar to the topmost heights of parnassus he but seldom descends to its base setting aside the publishers and the biographers it is more fruitful to inquire what were the opinions of moore's poetical contemporaries byron's eulogy of some of the earlier irish melodies as worth all the epics that ever were composed is hardly to be called criticism 
but at any rate it is honest enthusiasm lee hunt though taking a lower view of his friend's talent considered that moore was equally sure of present and future fame christopher north thought moore to be the best of all songwriters and actually held him to be the superior of burns in richness in variety in grace in the power of art while scott ever prodigal of generous praise wrote of him as his equal and brother-in-arms these high tributes to moore's maturer fame are the more remarkable because he was not exempt from dispraise in his earlier career the savage onslaught of geoffrey in the edinburgh review need not be too seriously taken it was applied only to moore's earliest and least considerable volumes of original poetry and its sting was drawn by the subsequent cordiality of the critic towards the young writer whom he not undeservedly rebuked that there was some justice in jeffrey's needlessly acrimonious strictures on the poems of mr thomas little as the most licentious of modern versifiers and the most poetical of those who in our times have devoted their talents to the propagation of immorality no one who has read the original volume will be inclined to deny and that these verses produced not a little of the effect they were qualified to exercise is plain enough not only from byron's couplet in english bards and scotch reviewers which passed a just judgment on moore's earliest book but from the actual language of one of byron's letters i believe he wrote to moore himself in eighteen twenty all the mischief i have ever done or sung has been owing to that confounded book of yours yet though these early verses exhibit too much of the prurience to which adolescence is prone and though byron's description of the young author as a melodious advocate of lust was not entirely undeserved carlyle's contemptuous verdict on moore in later years as a lascivious triviality of great fame is certainly unwarranted and excessive moore's libertinism was harmless enough as someone has said he was only an amateur rake and the tone of his amorous sallies has been admirably characterized in the description applied to the poet by one of his friends as an infant sporting in the bosom of venus in accounting for the marvellous success which a youth of barely twenty-one of humble origin and of irish birth took by storm in a few months the world of london moore's remarkable social and musical gifts must not be overlooked eminent as were his poetical qualities moore owed the rapid rise of his fame in the first instance not so much to his poetry as to his talents as a musician he was in fact as has been justly said a nineteenth-century troubadour whose spirit was equally sympathetic to music and to song his attractive personality and extraordinary social talents had won him his way into the most exclusive coteries of london long before the poems which are his chief title to fame had been written and the same engaging qualities served to retain for him a continuance of the same generous meed of exaggerated applause long after his poetical powers had manifestly declined from their zenith there was about moore as scott said a manly frankness with perfect ease and breeding which was delightful and his countenance plain but animated especially in speaking or singing and more interesting than the finest features could have rendered it contributed to the charm of his personality the first instalment of the irish melodies upon which moore's enduring fame now mainly depends did not appear till eighteen o seven lala rook did not appear until ten years later yet long before either of them had been published the youthful son of john moore a small grocer in dublin so moore described himself to the prince regent had become the protege of holland house and had earned fame enough to be deemed a mark for the denunciations of geoffrey and the lampoons of byron 
the peculiar source of moore's musical effects have been often described and the tradition still lingers of his marvellous power over the emotions of his audience n t willis in his pencillings by the way has given in a few sentences a wonderfully vivid sketch of his after-dinner performances he makes no attempt at music it is a kind of admirable recitative in which every shade of thought is syllabled and dwelt upon and the sentiment of the song goes through your blood warming you to the very eyelids and starting your tears if you have a soul or senses in you i have heard of a woman's fainting at a song of moore's but successes of this sort have their drawbacks they inevitably provoked criticisms which labelled moore unjustly enough as no more than a carpet poet and in any case it was impossible that impressions thus created should retain their power when the source of them was withdrawn it was no wonder that the magic of such a personality should have cast a spell over his contemporaries which distorted their judgment of his purely poetical qualities or that with such gifts moore should have retained for something like half a century the affectionate homage of many of the most eminent englishmen of his time but it was certain that as the memory of the man inevitably faded the fame of the poet should become tarnished setting aside his juvenile efforts moore's poetical claims rest upon three classes of poetry viz the narrative poems of which lalla rook is the chief and indeed practically the only serious example the satirical poems which constitute so large a portion of his total production and the songs and lyrical pieces mostly comprised in the irish melodies national airs and sacred songs but also scattered through his miscellaneous pieces and interspersed after the manner of scott and byron in the longer poems a word may fitly be said here on each of these chief divisions into which moore's work naturally falls lalla rook has long since fallen into a disrepute almost as undeserved as the extravagant admiration once bestowed on it perhaps it would be difficult to indicate its characteristic merits more clearly than by noting that it is in france and at the hands of a french critic that the work has latterly received the most respectful treatment for the poem like the genius of its author has qualities of brilliancy alike of conception and execution which are distinctively french we may hesitate indeed to say with m vallat that for the excellence of its poetry as well as for the power of invention and execution which it displays la la rook is one of the finest poems in the english language but it is impossible to deny the abundant fertility of fancy the luxuriant profusion of imagery or the facile command of graceful diction which it displays throughout it is true that as hazlitt has observed its brilliancy is too continuously glittering and its ornament lavish beyond the limits of good taste the atmosphere intended to be redolent of the odours of the east is sometimes merely reminiscent of the atmosphere of a hairdresser's shop yet if as geoffrey justly said moore in his lala rook dazzles rather than enchants us it is undeniable that he has given us not a few passages of great descriptive power of singular narrative charm and of delicate imaginative art an element alike of contemporary strength and of posthumous weakness in moore's popularity lay in the fact that a very large part of his work perhaps a third of the whole was devoted to political satire for political satire dependent as it is for its effect on the salt of pointed personal allusion but seldom preserves for posterity the savour which it possessed for those for whom it was written to achieve immortality in this sort of composition requires in the author satirical genius of the highest kind and even such genius may not be sufficient if the objects of the satire are not themselves so illustrious or so notorious as to attract the interest of ages later than their own 
even the genius of dryden might have failed to make absalom and achitophel immortal had his satire embalmed a chicanery less distinguished than the intrigues of the politicians of the restoration and zimri himself might have been forgotten had the portrait been drawn from an original less unhappily distinguished than buckingham even the undying absurdity of human nature to use moore's own phrase is insufficient to render the most successful ridicule intelligible to future times and generations without such aids as these that in spite of these drawbacks and disabilities many of moore's political pasquinades are still readable is a high testimony to his powers as a satirist one does not of course include in this category his more serious efforts in political satire in such set pieces as corruption intolerance and the sceptic in which he assumed the role of the heavy father moore attempted a part quite unsuited to his powers yet even here there are strokes that should not be forgotten as for example in the lines in which disgusted with the failure of the cabinet of all the talents to realize any of the golden visions of reform which the advent to power of fox and his adherents had conjured up he castigates his friends the whigs but bees on flowers alighting cease to hum so settling upon places whigs grow dumb nor could the change from the prerogatives of tudor or stuart sovereignty to the mild sway of modern constitutional monarchy be expressed with more terse felicity than in the couplet that ponderous sceptre in whose place we bow to the light talisman of influence now these serious pieces have however been long forgotten and they have been forgotten deservedly the lines just quoted are the only ones that justify corruption how many a doubt pursues how oft we sigh when history's charm to think that history's lie is a couplet perhaps worth rescuing from the sceptic intolerance however is quite intolerably turgid it was far otherwise with moore's lighter satirical vein in the twopenny post-bag the fudge family in paris and the fables for the holy alliance the subjects are not beneath the dignity of poetry though many of the allusions are lost to the modern reader castle ray and eldon to name two of the most frequent targets for the most pointed arrows of moore's deftly feathered wit have still life enough in them to give point to the quips which so much delighted the england of the regency and in the congress of vienna and the holy alliance moore was fleshing his sword in the greatest personages and the greatest events of the nineteenth century for lightness of touch appositeness of ridicule and genuine mirth-provoking wit some of moore's work in this kind is unsurpassed and unsurpassable in english satire some of the pieces may perhaps be matched for adroit dexterity and sprightly illusion in the rolliad and nothing in moore is quite equal to the sustained ferocity of invective worthy of a metrical genius which distinguishes some of the poetry of the anti-jacobin but if canning in a few pieces the new morality for instance excels moore in the power of transmitting the scourge of ridicule through succeeding periods with a lash still fresh for the back of the bigot and the oppressor under whatever new shapes they may present themselves neither canning nor any one else is comparable to moore for the extent and variety of his humorous political verse except in rare cases the shafts of moore's wit leave no sting behind his humour is continually softened by his good humour there was no malignity about his wit and few of the objects of his ridicule cherished any real resentment against him one of the most creditable anecdotes recorded of george the fourth is that in which lockhart represents the regent as quoting with good-tempered amusement moore's most brilliant lampoons upon himself it is not however by lalla 
or any of the more ambitious performances in which he sought to rival the most splendid of his contemporaries nor yet by his political satires admirable as they are that moore's place in the poetical firmament is to be determined it is as the lyricist of the irish melodies that his light will shine enduringly not indeed with the power of a star of the first magnitude but with a lustre peculiarly its own it is significant of the saving good sense which lay at the root of his character that moore himself felt and recognised that it is on these songs that he must base his claim to lasting fame however great his disappointment at the verdict of the best critics on his more grandiose efforts he ended by recognising its justice in the introduction to the fourth volume of his complete works he concludes his account of the melodies by styling them the only work of my pen as i very sincerely believe whose fame thanks to the sweet music in which it is embalmed may boast a chance of prolonging its existence to a day much beyond our own and in dear harp of my country he has given poetical expression to the same sentiments i was but as the wind passing heedlessly over and all the wild sweetness i waked was thy own the generous modesty with which moore is thus content to ascribe the fame of the melodies to their music is unjust to their merits as poetry it is true indeed that those who only know these songs in association with the airs to which they are set will sometimes find a difficulty in appreciating their value considered simply as poems so exquisitely intimate is their union of music and poetry the music lingers in memory and dominates the impression which the words alone should produce the very success with which the poet subordinates his songs to their setting militates against the appreciation of their poetical merit those however who read the melodies simply as verse will find in them both the impulse and the form of genuine poetry it is true that as tennyson as candid a critic of the verse of other poets as he was fastidious in his judgment of his own has observed hardly anything in moore is altogether what it should be even the best of his songs are lacking in the technical excellence which had they not been written primarily for music they would almost certainly have possessed for the technical excellence of lalla rook and generally of moore's work when unhampered by a musical context is much greater than the technical excellence of the melodies it is doubtless to this defect that we must attribute the comparatively slender representation of moore in the golden treasury though even so exacting a critic as mr palgrave would probably have admitted that the five pieces included in his anthology do not exhaust the list of moore's songs which deserve the praise of that excellence in the whole as well as in the parts which is the condition of inclusion in his collection though not all the melodies derive their inspiration from patriotism it may fairly be said upon the whole that what gives to these poems their chief distinction is their note of a simple sincere and natural patriotism this sentiment of patriotism is a note as real and distinctive in the poems as the note of celtic melancholy is distinctive in the music of the melodies not merely do they supply in their musical setting the most successful example which poetry can present of the happy union of national song with national sentiment but they breathe in every line the genuine love of fatherland which appeals to every irish nature and which accounts for the affection with which all the world over moore is hailed by men of irish blood as peculiarly the laureate of erin not that moore was at any time a patriot in the political sense he was indeed the early friend of robert emmet and there is no more winning trait in his character than his constant devotion to the memory of the friend whose fate inspired at least three of the most touching of his lyrics 
moore was also at all times the energetic champion of the rights of a creed to which however lightly it may have sat on him he remained true to the end friend as he was to the whig leaders whose support and favour were all his life long almost a vital element in his worldly prosperity he did not hesitate to turn on them when they seemed to be false to their profession of solicitude for ireland it was anger at the desertion of the cause of catholic emancipation by the colleagues of fox that drew from him that witty satire on the whigs already quoted which redeems from worthlessness his otherwise turgid poem corruption and it further illustrates the depth of moore's political feelings that the only instances in which the arrows of his satirical wit ever seem to be poisoned by vindictiveness are those with which he assailed castlereagh as the author of the union in other respects moore's patriotism is singularly pure singularly unsullied by his personalities few if any of the melodies with the exception of when first i met thee warm and young which he himself tells us was intended as a rebuke to the prince regent's abandonment of the whigs were written with any reference to party politics but his attachment to his native land was always deep and strong and if all his life through he appeared to prefer the salons of holland house or the pleasure grounds of bowwood to the society of his countrymen at home it was doubtless because he felt in his own person the sentiments he attributes to the ancient bards of ireland in the poem which stands first in this selection o oh, blame not the bard if he fly to the bowers where pleasure lies carelessly smiling at fame he was born for much more and in happier hours his soul might have burned with a holier flame the string that now languishes loose o'er the lyre might have been a proud bow to the warrior's dart and the lips which now breathe but the song of desire might have poured the full tide of a patriot's heart that the poetry of thomas moore should find a place in the golden treasury series with the poetry of byron and of shelley of wordsworth and of southey may perhaps excite a mild surprise in readers who had forgotten the eminence once occupied by the author of lala rook in the estimation of the public of his own day so complete is the revolution wrought in literary taste by the criticism of the last generation that the warmest lovers of literature have grown to disdain the school of poetry which most delighted their grandfathers the exaltation of the moral over the merely picturesque elements in poetry which it has been the business of most modern critics to inculcate has thrown into disrepute that poetry of the fancy of the affections and of the lighter emotions which was the principal preoccupation of the muse of moore but the notion that nothing in poetry can be considered as permanent and immortal which does not closely accord with the higher elements of our nature has perhaps been carried too far it is as well to remind ourselves that the poetry which touches the heart even if it does not reach the soul is poetry all the same what macaulay wrote of the great poet with whose name that of moore is so closely and so honourably linked is true of the author of lala rook he was guilty of the offence which of all offences is punished most severely he had been overpraised and if more fortunate than his great contemporary the immense popularity of moore's engaging personality procured the postponement of the reaction against exaggerated eulogy until after his death the posthumous penalty has been all the heavier one must go back to cowley for a parallel to the contrast between the brilliant noonday splendour of contemporary approbation and the darkness of the ensuing eclipse which moore's case presents and indeed it is curious how closely applicable to the irish poet are pope's strictures on the prodigy of the restoration period who now reads cowley if he pleases yet his moral pleases not his pointed wit forgot his epic 
nay pindaric art but still i love the language of his heart and so of moore his ambitious poems his loves of the angels his elsifron and his imitations of anacreon are almost as dead as the davides or pindarics of cowley but the irish melodies the true language of moore's heart endure and will endure and though no one now dreams of bracketing more with byron in the poetic hierarchy the language with which macaulay closed his summary of the qualities of the former might have been applied without very great exaggeration to the poetry of the latter that much of his poetry will undergo a severe sifting that much of what has been admired by his contemporaries will be rejected as worthless we have little doubt but we have as little doubt that after the closest scrutiny there will still remain much that can only perish with the english language the text of the collected editions of moore's poetical works in ten volumes published in eighteen forty one to eighteen forty two has been followed in these selections End of the introduction of poetry of thomas moore selected and arranged by c lytton falconer section one from irish melodies part one by thomas moore read for librivox dot org by noel Badrian. O oh, blame not the bard o oh, blame not the bard if he fly to the bowers where pleasures lie carelessly smiling at fame he was born for much more and in happier hours his soul might have burned with a holier flame the string that now languishes loose o'er the lyre might have bent a proud bow to the warrior's dart and the lip which now breathes but the song of desire might have poured the full tide of a patriot's heart but alas for his country her pride is gone by and that spirit is broken which never would bend o'er the ruin her children in secret must sigh for tis treason to love her and death to defend unprized are her sons till they've learnt to betray undistinguished they live if they shame not their sires and the torch that would light them through dignity's way must be caught from the pile where their country expires then blame not the bard if in pleasure's soft dream he should try to forget what he never can heal oh give but a hope let a vista but gleam through the gloom of his country and mark how he'll feel that instant his heart at her shrine would lay down every passion it nursed every bliss it adored while the myrtle now idly entwined with his crown like the wreath of harmodius should cover his sword but though glory be gone and though hope fade away thy name loved erin shall live in his songs not even in the hour when his heart is most gay will he lose the remembrance of thee and thy wrongs the stranger shall hear thy lament on his plains the sigh of thy harp shall be sent o'er the deep till thy masters themselves as they rivet thy chains shall pause at the song of their captive and weep End of poem. Erin, the tear and the smile in thine eyes. Erin, the tear and the smile in thine eyes blend like the rainbow that hangs in thy skies, shining through sorrow's stream, saddening through pleasure's beam. Thy sons with doubtful gleam weep while they rise. Erin, thy silent tear never shall cease erin thy languid smile ne'er shall increase till like the rainbow's light thy various tints unite and form in heaven's sight one arch of peace end of poem go where glory waits thee 
go where glory waits thee but while fame elates thee oh still remember me when the praise thou meetest to thy ear is sweetest oh then remember me other arms may press thee dearer friends caress thee all the joys that bless thee sweeter far may be but when friends are nearest and when joys are dearest oh then remember me when at eve thou rovest by the star thou lovest oh then remember me think when home returning bright we've seen it burning oh thus remember me oft as summer closes when thine eye reposes on its lingering roses once so loved by thee think of her who wove them her who made thee love them oh then remember me when round thee dying autumn leaves are lying oh then remember me and at night when gazing on the gay hearth blazing oh still remember me then should music stealing all the soul of feeling to thy heart appealing draw one tear from thee then let memory bring thee strains i used to sing thee oh then remember me end of poem oh breathe not his name oh breathe not his name let it sleep in the shade where cold and unhonoured his relics are laid sad silent and dark be the tears that we shed as the night dew that falls on the grass o'er his head but the night dew that falls though in silence it weeps shall brighten with verdure the grave where he sleeps and the tear that we shed though in secret it rolls shall long keep his memory green in our souls end of poem when he who adores thee when he who adores thee has left but the name of his faults and his sorrows behind oh say wilt thou weep when they darken the fame of a life that for thee was resigned yes weep and however my foes may condemn thy tears shall efface their decree for heaven can witness though guilty to them i have been but too faithful to thee with thee were the dreams of my earliest love every thought of my reason was thine in my last humble prayer to the spirit above thy name shall be mingled with mine o oh, blessed are the lovers and friends who shall live the days of thy glory to see but the next dearest blessing that heaven can give is the pride of thus dying for thee end of poem she is far from the land she is far from the land where her young hero sleeps and lovers are round her sighing but coldly she turns from their gaze and weeps for her heart in his grave is lying she sings the wild song of her dear native plains every note which he loved awaking ah little they think who delight in her strains how the heart of the minstrel is breaking he had lived for his love for his country he died they were all that to life had entwined him nor soon shall the tears of his country be dried nor long will his love stay behind him oh make her a grave where the sunbeams rest when they promise a glorious morrow they'll shine o'er her sleep like a smile from the west from her own loved island of sorrow end of poem the harp that once through tara's halls the harp that once through tara's halls the soul of music shed 
now hangs as mute on tara's walls as if that soul were fled so sleeps the pride of former days so glory's thrill is o'er and hearts that once beat high for praise now feel that pulse no more no more to chiefs and ladies bright the harp of tara swells the chord alone that breaks at night its tale of ruin tells thus freedom now so seldom wakes the only throb she gives is when some heart indignant breaks to show that she still lives end of poem rich and rare were the gems she wore rich and rare were the gems she wore and a bright gold ring on her wand she bore but oh her beauty was far beyond her sparkling gems or snow-white wand lady dost thou not fear to stray so lone and lovely through this bleak way are erin's sons so good or so cold as not to be tempted by woman or gold sir knight i feel not the least alarm no son of erin will offer me harm for though they love woman and golden store sir knight they love honour and virtue more on she went and her maiden smile in safety lighted her round the green isle and blessed for ever is she who relied upon erin's honour and erin's pride end of poem as a beam o'er the face of the waters may glow as a beam o'er the face of the waters may glow while the tide runs in darkness and coldness below so the cheek may be tinged with a warm sunny smile though the cold heart to ruin runs darkly the while one fatal resemblance one sorrow that throws its bleak shade alike o'er our joys and our woes to which life nothing darker or brighter can bring for which joy has no balm and affliction no sting oh this thought in the midst of enjoyment will stay like a dead leafless branch in the summer's bright ray the beams of a warm sun play round it in vain it may smile in his light but it blooms not again end of poem the meeting of the waters there is not in the wide world a valley so sweet as that vale in whose bosom the bright waters meet oh the last rays of feeling and life must depart ere the bloom of that valley shall fade from my heart yet it was not that nature that shed o'er the scene her purest of crystal and brightest of green twas not her soft magic of streamlet or hill oh no it was something more exquisite still twas that friends the beloved of my bosom were near who made every dear scene of enchantment more dear and who felt how the best charms of nature improve when we see them reflected from looks that we love sweet vale of evoker how calm could i rest in thy bosom of shade with the friends i love best where the storms that we feel in this cold world should cease and our hearts like thy waters be mingled in peace end of poem the legacy when in death i shall calmly recline o oh, bear my heart to my mistress dear tell her it lived upon smiles and wine of the brightest hue while it lingered here bid her not shed one tear of sorrow to sully a heart so brilliant and light but balmy drops of the red grape borrow to bathe the relic from morn till night when the light of my song is o'er then take my harp to your ancient hall hang it up at that friendly door where weary travellers love to call then if some bard who roams forsaken revive its soft note in passing along 
oh let one thought of its master waken your warmest smile for the child of song keep this cup which is now o'erflowing to grace your revel when i'm at rest never oh never its balm bestowing on lips that beauty hath seldom blessed but when some warm devoted lover to her he adores shall bathe its brim then then my spirit around shall hover and hallow each drop that foams for him end of poem this recording is in the public domain section two from irish melodies part two by thomas moore read for librivox dot org by noel badrian we may roam through this world we may roam through this world like a child at a feast who but sips of a sweet and then flies to the nest and when pleasure begins to grow dull in the east we may order our wings and be off to the west but if hearts that feel and eyes that smile are the dearest gifts that heaven supplies we never need leave our own green isle for sensitive hearts and for sun-bright eyes then remember wherever your goblet is crowned through this world whether eastward or westward you roam when a cup to the smile of dear woman goes round oh remember the smile which adorns her at home in england the garden of beauty is kept by a dragon of prudery placed within call but so oft this unamiable dragon has slept that the gardens but carelessly watched after all oh they want the wild briery fence which round the flowers of erin dwells which warns the touch while winning the sense nor charms us least when it most repels then remember wherever your goblet is crowned through this world whether eastward or westward you roam when a cup to the smile of dear woman goes round oh remember the smile that adorns her at home in france when the heart of a woman sets sail on the ocean of wedlock is fortune to try love seldom goes far in a vessel so frail but just pilots her off and then bids her good-bye while the daughters of erin keep the boy ever smiling beside his faithful oar through billows of woe and beams of joy the same as he looked when he left the shore then remember wherever your goblet is crowned through this world whether eastward or westward you roam when a cup to the smile of dear woman goes round oh remember the smile that adorns her at home end of poem let erin remember the days of old let erin remember the days of old ere her faithless sons betrayed her when Malachi wore the collar of gold which he won from her proud invader, when her kings with standards of green unfurled led the red branch knights to danger, ere the emerald gem of the western world was set in the crown of a stranger. On Loch Ney's bank, as the fisherman strays, when the clear cold eaves declining, he sees the round towers of other days in the wave beneath him shining. Thus shall memory often, in dreams sublime, catch a glimpse of the days that are over. Thus, sighing, look through the waves of time for the long faded glories they cover. End of poem. The Song of Finula. Silent, O Moyle, be the roar of thy water. Break not, ye breezes, your chain of repose. While murmuring mournfully, Lear's lonely daughter tells to the night star her tale of woe. When shall the swan her death note singing 
sleep with wings in darkness furled when will heaven its sweet bell ringing call my spirit from this stormy world sadly o moil to thy winter wave weeping fate bids me languish long ages away yet still in her darkness doth erin lie sleeping still doth the pure light its dawning delay when will that day star mildly springing warm our isle with peace and love when will heaven its sweet bell ringing call my spirit to the fields above end of poem believe me if all those endearing young charms believe me if all those endearing young charms which i gaze on so fondly to-day were to change by to-morrow and fleet in my arms like fairy gifts fading away thou wouldst still be adored as this moment thou art let thy loveliness fade as it will and around the dear ruin each wish of my heart would entwine itself verdantly still it is not while beauty and youth are thine own and thy cheeks unprofaned by a tear that the fervour and faith of a soul can be known to which time will but make thee more dear no the heart that has truly loved never forgets but as truly loves on to the close as the sunflower turns on her god when he sets the same look which she turned when he rose End of poem. Erin, O oh Erin. Like the bright lamp that shone in Kildare's holy fane and burned through long ages of darkness and storm, is the heart that sorrows have frowned on in vain, whose spirit outlives them, unfading and warm. Erin, O oh Erin, thus bright through the tears of a long night of bondage thy spirit appears the nations have fallen and thou still art young thy sun is but rising when others are set and though slavery's cloud o'er thy mornings hath hung the full noon of freedom shall beam round thee yet erin o oh erin though long in the shade thy star will shine out when the proudest shall fade unchilled by the rain and unwaked by the wind the lily lies sleeping through winter's cold hour till spring's light touch her fetters unbind and daylight and liberty bless the young flower thus erin o oh erin thy winter is past and the hope that lived through it shall blossom at last end of poem after the battle night closed round the conqueror's way and lightnings showed the distant hill where those who lost that dreadful day stood few and faint but fearless still the soldier's hope the patriot's zeal forever dimmed forever crossed oh who shall say what heroes feel when all but life and honour's lost the last sad hour of freedom's dream and valour's task moved slowly by while mute they watched till morning's beam should rise and give them light to die there's yet a world where souls are free where tyrants taint not nature's bliss if death that world's bright opening be oh who would live a slave in this end of poem the origin of the harp tis believed that this harp which i wake now for thee was a siren of old who sung under the sea and who often at eve through the bright waters roved to meet on the green shore a youth whom she loved but she loved him in vain for he left her to weep and in tears all the night her gold tresses to steep till heaven looked with pity on true love so warm 
and changed to this soft harp the sea maiden's form still her bosom rose fair still her cheeks smiled the same while her sea beauties gracefully formed a light frame and her hair as let loose o'er her white arm it fell was changed to bright chords uttering melody's spell hence it came that this soft harp so long hath been known to mingle love's language with sorrow's sad tone till thou didst divide them and teach the fond lay to speak love when i'm near thee and grief when away End of poem. Love's Young Dream Oh, the days are gone when beauty bright my heart's chain wove, when my dream of life from morn till night was love, still love, new hope my bloom, and days may come of milder, calmer beam, but there's nothing half so sweet in life as love's young dream. No, there's nothing half so sweet in life as love's young dream. Though the bard to purer fame may soar when wild youth's past, though he win the wise who frowned before to smile at last, he'll never meet a joy so sweet in all his noon of fame as when first he sung to woman's ear his soul felt flame and at every close she blushed to hear the one loved name no that hallowed form is near forgot which first love traced still it lingering haunts the greenest spot on memory's waste twas odour fled as soon as shed twas morning's winged dream twas a light that ne'er can shine again on life's dull stream oh twas light that ne'er can shine again on life's dull stream end of poem weep on weep on weep on weep on your hour is past your dreams of pride are o'er the fatal chain is round your cast and you are men no more in vain the hero's heart hath bled the sage's tongue hath warned in vain o oh, freedom once thy flame hath fled it never lights again weep on perhaps in after days they'll learn to love your name when many a deed may wake in praise that long hath slept in blame and where they tread the ruined isle where rest at length the lord and slave they'll wondering ask how hands so vile could conquer hearts so brave twas fate they'll say a wayward fate your web of discourse wove and while your tyrants joined in hate you never joined in love but hearts fell off that ought to twine and man profaned what god had given till some were heard to curse the shrine where others knelt to heaven end of poem nora craner lesbia hath a beaming eye but no one knows for whom it beameth right and left its arrows fly but what they aim at no one dreameth sweeter tis to gaze upon my nora's lid that seldom rises few its looks but every one like unexpected lights surprises oh my nora craner dear my gentle bashful nora craner beauty lies in many eyes but love in yours my nora craner lesbia wears a robe of gold but all so close the nymph hath laced it not a charm of beauty's mould presumes to stay where nature placed it oh my nora's gown for me that floats as wild as mountain breezes leaving every beauty free to sink or swell as heaven pleases yes my nora craner dear my simple graceful nora craner nature's dress is loveliness 
the dress you wear, my Nora Crena. Lesbia hath a wit refined, but when its points are gleaming round us, who can tell if they are designed to dazzle merely or to wound us? Pillowed on my Nora's heart, in safer slumber love reposes. Bed of peace, whose roughest part is but the crumpling of the roses. O oh, my Nora Crena dear, my mild, my artless Nora Crena, wit, though bright, hath no such light as warms your eyes, my Nora Crena. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Section 3 From Irish Melodies, Part 3 by Thomas Moore. Read for LibriVox.org by Noel Badrian. By that lake whose gloomy shore, by that lake whose gloomy shore, Skylark never warbles o'er, where the cliff hangs high and steep, young Saint Kevin stole to sleep. Here, at least, he calmly said, woman near shall find my bed. Ah, the good saint little knew what that wily sex can do. Twas from Kathleen's eyes he flew, eyes of most unholy blue. She had loved him well and long, wished him hers, nor thought it wrong. Wheresoe'er the saint would fly, still he heard her light foot nigh. East or west, where'er he turned, still her eyes before him burned. On the bold cliff's bosom cast, tranquil now he sleeps at last. Dreams of heaven, nor thinks that ere woman's smile can haunt him there. But nor earth nor heaven is free from her power, if fond she be. Even now, while calm he sleeps, Kathleen o'er him leans and weeps. Fearless she has tracked his feet to this rocky wild retreat, and when morning met his view, her mild glances met it too. Ah, your saints have cruel hearts. Sternly from his bed he starts, and with rude repulsive shock hurls her from the beetling rock. Glendaloch, thy gloomy wave, Soon was gentle Kathleen's grave. Soon the saint, yet ah, too late, Felt her love and mourned her fate. When he said, Heaven rest her soul, Round the lake light music stole, And her ghost was seen to glide, Smiling o'er the fatal tide. End of poem At the mid-hour of night at the mid-hour of night, when stars are weeping, I fly to the lone vale we loved when life shone warm in thine eye. And I think oft, if spirits can steal from the regions of air to revisit past scenes of delight, thou wilt come to me there, and tell me our love is remembered even in the sky. Then I sing the wild song, T'was once such pleasure to hear, When our voices commingling breathed Like one on the ear, And, as echo far off through the vale, My sad horizon rolls. I think, O oh, my love, Tis thy voice from the kingdom of souls, Faintly answering still the notes That once were so dear. End of poem. One bumper at parting. One bumper at parting, though many have circled the board since we met, the fullest, the saddest of any, remains to be crowned by us yet. The sweetness that pleasure hath in it is always so slow to come forth, that seldom, alas, till the minute it dies do we know half its worth. But come, may our life's happy measure Be all of such moments made up, They're born on the bosom of pleasure, 
they die midst the tears of the cup as onward we journey how pleasant to pause and inhabit a while those few sunny spots like the present that mid the dull wilderness smile but time like a pitiless master cries onward and spurs the gay hours ah never doth time travel faster than when his way lies among flowers but come may our life's happy measure be all of such moments made up they're born on the bosom of pleasure they die midst the tears of the cup we saw how the sun looked in sinking the waters beneath him how bright and now let our farewell of drinking resemble the farewell of light you saw how he finished by darting his beam o'er a deep billow's brim so fill up let's shine at our parting in full liquid glory like him and oh may our life's happy measure of moments like this be made up twas born on the bosom of pleasure it dies mid the tears of the cup end of poem tis the last rose of summer tis the last rose of summer left blooming alone all her lovely companions are faded and gone no flower of her kindred no rosebud is nigh to reflect back her blushes or give sigh for sigh i'll not leave thee thou lone one to pine on the stem since the lovely are sleeping go sleep thou with them thus kindly i scatter thy leaves o'er the bed where thy mates of the garden lie scentless and dead so soon may i follow when friendships decay and from love's shining circle the gems drop away when true hearts lie withered and fond ones are flown oh who would inhabit this bleak world alone end of poem the young may moon the young may moon is beaming love the glow-worm's lamp is gleaming love how sweet to rove through mourner's grove when the drowsy world is dreaming love then awake the heavens look bright my dear tis never too late for delight my dear and the best of all ways to lengthen our days is to steal a few hours from the night my dear now all the world is sleeping love but the sage his star watch keeping love and i whose star more glorious far is the eye from that casement peeping love then awake till rise of sun my dear the sage's glass will shun my dear or in watching the flight of bodies of light he might happen to take thee for one my dear end of poem the minstrel boy the minstrel boy to the war is gone in the ranks of death you'll find him his father's sword he has girded on and his wild harp slung behind him land of song said the warrior bard though all the world betrays thee one sword at least thy right shall guard one faithful harp shall praise thee the minstrel fell but the foeman's chain could not bring his proud soul under the harp he loved ne'er spoke again for he tore its cords asunder and said no chains shall sully thee thou soul of love and bravery thy songs were made for the pure and free they shall never sound in slavery end of poem farewell but whenever you welcome the hour farewell but whenever you welcome the hour that awakens the night song of mirth in your bower then think of the friend who once welcomed it too and forgot his own grief to be happy with you 
his griefs may return not a hope may remain of the few that have brightened his pathway of pain but he ne'er will forget the short vision that threw its enchantment around him while lingering with you and still on that evening when pleasure fills up to the highest top sparkle each harp and each cup where'er my path lies be it gloomy or bright my soul happy friends shall be with you that night shall join in your revels your sports and your wiles and return to me beaming all o'er with your smiles too blessed if it tells me that mid the gay cheer some kind voice had murmured i wish he were here let fate do her worst there are relics of joy bright dreams of the past which she cannot destroy which come in the night-time of sorrow and care and bring back the features that joy used to wear long long be my heart with such memories filled like the vase in which roses have once been distilled you may break you may shatter the vase if you will but the scent of the roses will hang round it still End of poem. While History's Muse While History's Muse, the memorial was keeping Of all that the dark hand of destiny weaves, Beside her the genius of Erin stood weeping, For hers was the story that blotted the leaves. But oh, how the tear in her eyelids grew bright, when after whole pages of sorrow and shame she saw history write with a pencil of light that illumed the whole volume her wellington's name hail star of my isle said the spirit all sparkling with beams such as break from her own dewy skies through ages of sorrow deserted and darkling i've watched for some glory like thine to arise for though heroes i've numbered unblessed was their lot and unhallowed they sleep in the crossways of fame but oh there is not one dishonouring blot on the wreath that encircles my wellington's name yet still the last crown of thy toils is remaining the grandest the purest even thou hast yet known though proud was thy task other nations unchaining far prouder to heal the deep wounds of thy own at the foot of that throne for whose wheel thou hast stood go plead for the land that first cradled thy fame and bright o'er the flood of her tears and her blood let the rainbow of hope be her wellington's name End of poem. The time I've lost in wooing. The time I've lost in wooing, in watching and pursuing, the light that lies in woman's eyes has been my heart's undoing. Though wisdom oft has sought me, I scorned the law she brought me. My only books were woman's looks, and folly's all they've taught me. Her smile, when beauty granted, I hung with gaze enchanted, Like him the sprite, whom maids by night Oft met in glen that's haunted. Like him, too, beauty won me, But while her eyes were on me, If once their ray was turned away, Oh, winds could not outrun me. And are those follies going, and is my proud heart growing Too cold or wise for brilliant eyes, again to set it glowing? No, vain, alas, the endeavour, from bonds so sweet to sever, Poor wisdom's chance, against a glance, is now as weak as ever. The Time I've Lost in Wooing the time I've lost in wooing, in watching and pursuing, The light that lies in woman's eyes, has been my heart's undoing. Though wisdom oft has sought me, I scorned the law she brought me, My only books were woman's looks, and folly's all they've taught me. 
her smile when beauty granted i hung with gaze enchanted like him the sprite whom maids by night oft met in glen that's haunted like him too beauty won me but while her eyes were on me if once their ray was turned away oh winds could not outrun me and are those follies going and is my proud heart growing too cold or wise for brilliant eyes again to set it glowing no vain alas the endeavour from bonds so sweet to sever poor wisdom's chance against a glance is now as weak as ever end of poem this recording is in the public domain Section 4 from Irish Melodies, Part 4 by Thomas Moore. Read for LibriVox.org by Noel Badrian. I saw from the beach. I saw from the beach when the morning was shining, a bark o'er the waters moved gloriously on. I came when the sun o'er that beach was declining, the bark was still there but the waters were gone and such is the fate of our life's early promise so passing the springtide of joy we have known each wave that we danced on at morning ebbs from us and leaves us at eve on the bleak shore alone ne'er tell me of glories serenely adorning the close of our day the calm eve of our night give me back Give me back the wild freshness of morning. Her clouds and her tears are worth evening's best light. Oh, who would not welcome that moment's returning, When passion first waked a new life through his frame, And his soul, like the wood that grows precious in burning, Gave out all its sweets to love's exquisite flame. End of poem as slow our ship as slow our ship her foamy track against the wind was cleaving her trembling pennant still looked back to that dear isle twas leaving so loath we part from all we love from all the links that bind us so turns our heart as on we rove to those we've left behind us when round the bowl of vanished years we talk with joyous seeming with smiles that might as well be tears so faint so sad their beaming while memory brings us back again each early tie that twined us oh sweets the cup that circles then to those we've left behind us and when in other climes we meet some isle or vale enchanting where all looks flowery wild and sweet and naught but love is wanting we think how great had been our bliss if heaven had but assigned us to live and die in scenes like this with some we've left behind us as travellers oft look back at eve when eastward darkly going to gaze upon that light they leave still faint behind them glowing so when the close of pleasure's day to gloom hath near consigned us we turn to catch one fading ray of joy that's left behind us end of poem forget not the field forget not the field where they perished the truest the last of the brave all gone and the bright hope we cherished gone with them and quenched in their grave oh could we from death but recover those hearts as they bounded before in the face of high heaven to fight over that combat for freedom once more could the chain for an instant be riven which tyranny flung round us then no tis not in man nor in heaven to let tyranny bind it again but tis past and 
though blazoned in story the name of our victory may be accursed is the march of that glory which treads o'er the hearts of the free far dearer the grave or the prison illumed by one patriot name than the trophies of all who have risen on liberty's ruins to fame end of poem the parallel yes sad one of scion if closely resembling in shame and in sorrow thy withered up heart if drinking deep deep of the same cup of trembling could make us thy children our parent thou art like thee doth our nation lie conquered and broken and fallen from her head is the once royal crown in her streets in her halls desolation hath spoken and while it is day yet her sun hath gone down like thine doth her exile mid dreams of returning die far from the home it were life to behold like thine do her sons in the day of their mourning remember the bright things that blessed them of old ah well may we call her like thee the forsaken her boldest are vanquished her proudest are slaves and the harps of her minstrels when gayest they waken have tones mid their mirth like the wind over graves yet hadst thou thy vengeance yet came there the morrow that shines out at last on the longest dark night when the sceptre that smote thee with slavery and sorrow was shivered at once like a reed in thy sight when that cup which for others the proud golden city had brimmed full of bitterness drenched her own lips and the world she had trampled on heard without pity the howl in her halls and the cry from her ships when the curse heaven keeps for the haughty came over her merchants rapacious her rulers unjust and a ruin at last for the earthworm to cover the lady of kingdoms lay low in the dust end of poem echo how sweet the answer echo makes to music at night when roused by lute or horn she wakes and far away o'er lawns and lakes goes answering light yet love hath echoes truer far and far more sweet than ear beneath the moonlight star of horn or lute or soft guitar the songs repeat tis when the sigh in youth sincere and only then the sigh that's breathed for one to hear is by that one that only dear breathed back again end of poem and doth not a meeting like this and doth not a meeting like this make amends for all the long years i've been wandering away to see thus around me my youth's early friends as smiling and kind as in that happy day though haply o'er some of your brows as o'er mine the snowfall of time may be stealing what then like alps in the sunset thus lighted by wine we'll wear the gay tinge of youth's roses again what softened remembrances come o'er the heart in gazing on those we've been lost to so long the sorrows the joys of which once they were part still round them like visions of yesterday throng as letters some hand hath invisibly traced when held to the flame will steal out on the sight so many a feeling that long seemed effaced the warmth of a moment like this brings to light and thus as in memory's bark we shall glide to visit the scenes of our boyhood anew though oft we may see looking down on the tide the wreck of full many a hope shining through yet still as in fancy we point to the flowers that once made a garden of all the gay shore 
deceived for a moment will think them still ours and breathe the fresh air of life's morning once more end of poem sing sweet harp sing sweet harp o oh, sing to me some song of ancient days whose sounds in this sad memory long buried dreams shall raise some lay that tells of vanished fame whose light once round us shone of noble pride now turned to shame and hopes forever gone sing sad harp thus sing to me alike our doom is cast both lost to all but memory we live but in the past how mournfully the midnight air among thy chords doth sigh as if it sought some echo there of voices long gone by of chieftains now forgot who seemed the foremost then in fame of bards who once immortal deemed now sleep without a name in vain sad harp the midnight air among thy chords doth sigh in vain it seeks an echo there of voices long gone by couldst thou but call those spirits round who once in bower and hall sat listening to thy magic sound now mute and mouldering all but no they would but wake to weep their children's slavery then leave them in their dreamless sleep the dead at least are free hush hush sad harp that dreary tone that knell of freedom's day or listening to its death-like moan let me too die away end of poem silence is in our festal halls silence is in our festal halls sweet son of song thy courses are in vain on thee sad erin calls her minstrel's voice responds no more all silent as the aeolian shell sleeps at the close of some bright day when the sweet breeze that wakes its swell at sunny morn hath died away yet at our feasts thy spirit long awakened by music's spell shall rise for name so linked with deathless song partakes its charm and never dies and even within the holy fane when music wafts the soul to heaven one thought to him whose earliest strain was echoed there shall long be given but where is now the cheerful day the social night when by thy side he who now weaves this parting lay his skillless voice with thine allied and sung those songs whose every tone when bard and minstrel long have passed shall still in sweetness all their own embalmed by fame undying last yes erin thine alone the fame or if thy bard have shared the crown from thee the borrowed glory came and at thy feet is now laid down enough if freedom still inspire his latest song and still there be as evening closes round his lyre one ray upon its chords from thee end of poem dear harp of my country dear harp of my country in darkness i found thee the cold chain of silence had hung o'er thee long when proudly my own island harp i unbound thee and gave all thy chords to light freedom and song the warm lay of love and the light note of gladness have wakened thy fondest thy liveliest thrill but so oft hast thou echoed the deep sigh of sadness that even in thy mirth it will steal from thee still dear harp of my country farewell to thy numbers this sweet wreath of song is the last we shall twine go sleep with the sunshine of fame on thy slumbers till touched by some hand less unworthy than mine 
if the pulse of the patriot soldier or lover have throbbed at our lay tis thy glory alone i was but as the wind passing heedlessly over and all the wild sweetness i waked was thy own end of poem this recording is in the public domain Section 5 From National Airs by Thomas Moore Read for LibriVox.org by Noel Badrian Oft in the Stilly Night Oft in the stilly night, ere slumber's chain has bound me, Fond memory brings the light of other days around me the smiles the tears of boyhood years the words of love then spoken the eyes that shone now dimmed and gone the cheerful hearts now broken thus in the stilly night ere slumber's chain hath bound me sad memory brings the light of other days around me when i remember all the friends so linked together i've seen around me fall like leaves in wintry weather i feel like one who treads alone some banquet hall deserted whose lights are fled whose garlands dead and all but he departed thus in the stilly night ere slumber's chain has bound me sad memory brings the light of other days around me end of poem flow on thou shining river flow on thou shining river but ere thou reach the sea seek ella's bower and give her the wreaths i fling o'er thee and tell her thus if she'll be mine the current of our lives shall be with joys along their course to shine like those sweet flowers on thee but if in wandering thither thou findest she mocks my prayer then leave those wreaths to wither upon the cold bank there and tell her thus when youth is o'er her lone and loveless charms shall be thrown by upon life's weedy shore like those sweet flowers from thee end of poem so warmly we met so warmly we met and so fondly we parted that which was the sweeter even i could not tell that first look of welcome her sunny eyes darted or that tear of passion which blessed our farewell to meet was a heaven and to part thus another our joy and our sorrow seemed rivals in bliss oh cupid's two eyes are not liker each other in smiles and in tears than that moment to this the first was like daybreak new sudden delicious the dawn of a pleasure scarce kindled up yet the last like the farewell of daylight more precious more glowing and deep as tis nearer it set our meeting though happy was tinged by a sorrow to think that such happiness could not remain while our parting though sad gave a hope that to-morrow would bring back the blessed hour of meeting again end of poem come chase that starting tear away come chase that starting tear away ere mine to meet it springs to-night at least to-night be gay what e'er to-morrow brings like sunset gleams that linger late when all is darkening fast are hours like these we snatch from fate the brightest and the last to gild the deepening gloom if heaven but one bright hour allow oh think that one bright hour is given in all its splendour now let's live it out then sink in night like waves that from the shore one minute swell are touched with light 
then lost for evermore end of poem those evening bells those evening bells those evening bells how many a tale their music tells of youth and home and that sweet time when last i heard their soothing chime those joyous hours are passed away and many a heart that then was gay within the tomb now darkly dwells and hears no more those evening bells and so it will be when i am gone that tuneful peal will still ring on while other bards shall walk these dells and sing your praise sweet evening bells End of poem. Where are the visions? Where are the visions that round me once hovered? Forms that shed grace from their shadows alone. Looks fresh as light from a star just discovered, And voices that music might take for her own. Time, while I spoke, with his wings resting o'er me, heard me say where are those visions o oh, where and pointing his wand to the sunset before me said with a voice like the hollow wind there fondly i looked when the wizard had spoken and there mid the dim shining ruins of day saw by their light like a talisman broken the last golden fragments of hope melt away end of poem keep those eyes still purely mine keep those eyes still purely mine though far off i be when on others most they shine then think they're turned on me should those lips as now respond to sweet minstrelsy when their accents seem most fond then think they're breathed for me make what hearts thou wilt thy own if when all on thee fix their charmed thoughts alone thou think'st the while on me end of poem this recording is in the public domain Section 6 From Sacred Songs by Thomas Moore Read for LibriVox.org by Noel Badrian This world is all a fleeting show This world is all a fleeting show For man's illusion given The smiles of joy, the tears of woe Deceitful shine, deceitful flow there's nothing true but heaven and false the light on glory's plume as fading hues of even and love and hope and beauty's bloom are blossoms gathered for the tomb there's nothing bright but heaven poor wanderers of a stormy day from wave to wave we're driven and fancy's flash and reason's ray serve but to light the troubled way there's nothing calm but heaven end of poem weep not for those weep not for those whom the veil of the tomb in life's happy morning hath hid from our eyes ere sin threw a blight o'er the spirit's young bloom or earth had profaned what was born for the skies death chilled the fair fountain ere sorrow had stained it twas frozen in all the pure light of its course and but sleeps till the sunshine of heaven has unchained it to water that eden where first was its source weep not for those whom the veil of the tomb in life's happy morning hath hid from our eyes ere sin threw a blight o'er the spirit's young bloom or earth had profaned what was born for the skies 
mourn not for her the young bride of the vale our gayest and loveliest lost to us now ere life's early lustre had time to grow pale and the garland of love was yet fresh on her brow oh then was her moment dear spirit for flying from this gloomy world while its gloom was unknown and the wild hymns she warbled so sweetly in dying were echoed in heaven by lips like her own weep not for her in her springtime she flew to that land where the wings of the soul are unfurled and now like a star beyond the evening's cold dew looks radiantly down on the tears of this world end of poem sound the loud timbrel miriam's song and miriam the prophetess the sister of iron took a timbrel in her hand and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dancers Exodus chapter 15 verse 20 Sound the loud timbrel o'er Egypt's dark sea Jehovah has triumphed his people are free Sing for the pride of the tyrant is broken his chariots his horsemen all splendid and brave How vain was their boast for the Lord hath but spoken and chariots and horsemen are sunk in the wave sound the loud timbrel o'er egypt's dark sea jehovah has triumphed his people are free praise to the conqueror praise to the lord his word was our arrow his breath was our sword who shall return to tell egypt the story of those she sent forth in the hour of her pride for the lord hath looked out from his pillar of glory and all her brave thousands are dashed in the tide sound the loud timbrel o'er egypt's dark sea jehovah hath triumphed his people are free end of poem is it not sweet to think hereafter is it not sweet to think hereafter when the spirit leaves the sphere love with deathless wing shall waft her to those she long hath mourned for here hearts from which twas death to sever eyes this world can ne'er restore there as warm as bright as ever shall meet us and be lost no more when wearily we wander asking of earth and heaven where are they beneath whose smile we once lay basking blessed and thinking bliss would stay hope still lifts her radiant finger pointing to the eternal home upon whose portal yet they linger looking back for us to come alas alas doth hope deceive us shall friendship love shall all those ties that bind a moment and then leave us be found again where nothing dies oh if no other boon were given to keep our hearts from wrong and stain who would not try to win a heaven where all we love shall live again end of poem this recording is in the public domain Section 7 from Early Poems, Ballads and Songs, Part 1 by Thomas Moore Read for LibriVox.org by Noel Badrian To Someone That wrinkle, when first I espied it, at once put my heart out of pain till the eye that was glowing beside it disturbed my ideas again thou art just in the twilight at present when woman's declension begins when fading from all that is pleasant she bids a good night to her sins yet thou still art so lovely to me i would sooner my exquisite mother repose in the sunset of thee than bask in the noon 
of another. End of poem. To someone. When I loved you, I can't but allow I had many an exquisite minute. But the scorn that I feel for you now hath even more luxury in it. Thus, whether we're on or we're off, some witchery seems to await you. To love you was pleasant enough, but oh, tis delicious to hate you. End of poem. A Reflection at Sea See how, beneath the moonbeam's smile, Yon little billow heaves its breast, And foams and sparkles for a while, Then murmuring subsides to rest. Thus man, the sport of bliss and care, Rises on time's eventful sea, And, having swelled a moment there, Thus melts into eternity. End of poem Chloris and Fanny Chloris, if I were Persia's king, I'd make my graceful queen of thee, While Fanny, wild and artless thing, Should but thy humble handmaid be. There is but one objection in it, That, verily, I'm much afraid, I should, in some unlucky minute, Forsake the mistress for the maid. End of poem To Julia Weeping Oh, if your tears are given to care, If real woe disturbs your peace, Come to my bosom, weeping fair, And I will bid your weeping cease. But if with fancy's visioned fears, With dreams of woe your bosom thrill, you look so lovely in your tears that I must bid you drop them still. End of poem. To the large and beautiful Miss Someone. In allusion to some partnership in a lottery share. Impromptu. Ego pars. Virgil. In wedlock a species of lottery lies where in blanks and in prizes we deal. But how comes it that you, such a capital prize, should so long have remained in the wheel? If ever, by fortune's indulgent decree, to me such a ticket should roll, a sixteenth, heaven knows, were sufficient for me, for what could I do with the whole? End of poem Rondo Good night, good night, and is it so, and must I from my Rosa go? O oh, Rosa, say good night once more, and I'll repeat it o'er and o'er, till the first glance of dawning light shall find us saying still good night. And still good night, my Rosa, say, but whisper still a minute stay. And I will stay, and every minute shall have an age of transport in it, Till time himself shall stay his flight, to listen to our sweet good night. Good night, you'll murmur with a sigh, and tell me it is time to fly, And I will vow, will swear to go, while still that sweet voice murmurs no. Till slumber seal our weary sight, And then, my love, my soul, good night. End of poem Song Why does Asia deck the sky? Why does Asia deck the sky? Tis to be like thy looks of blue. Why is red the roses dye? Because it is thy blushes hue. All that's fair by love's decree Has been made resembling thee. Why is falling snow so white But to be like thy bosom fair? Why are solar beams so bright That they may seem thy golden hair? 
all that's bright by love's decree has been made resembling thee why are nature's beauties felt oh tis thine in her we see why has music power to melt oh because it speaks like thee all that's sweet by love's decree has been made resembling thee end of poem a night thought how oft a cloud with envious veil obscures yon bashful light which seems so modestly to steal along the waste of night tis thus the world's obtrusive wrongs obscure with malice keen some timid heart which only longs to live and die unseen end of poem the catalogue come tell me says rosa as kissing and kissed one day she reclined on my breast come tell me the number repeat me the list of the nymphs you have loved and caressed oh rosa twas only my fancy that roved my heart at the moment was free but i'll tell thee my girl how many i've loved and the number shall finish with thee my tutor was kitty in infancy wild she taught me the way to be blessed she taught me to love her i loved like a child but kitty could fancy the rest this lesson of dear and enrapturing law i have never forgot i allow i have had it by rote very often before but never by heart until now pretty martha was next and my soul was all flame but my head was so full of romance that i fancied her into some chivalry dame and i was her knight of the lance but martha was not of this fanciful school and she laughed at her poor little knight while i thought her a goddess she thought me a fool and i'll swear she was most in the right my soul was now calm till by chloris's looks again i was tempted to rove but chloris i found was so learned in books that she gave me more logic than love so i left this young sappho and hastened to fly to those sweeter logicians in bliss who argue the point with the soul-telling eye and convince us at once with a kiss oh susan was then all the world unto me but susan was piously given and the worst of it was she could never agree on the road that was shortest to heaven oh susan i've said in the moments of mirth what's devotion to thee or to me i devoutly believe there's a heaven on earth and believe that that heaven's in thee End of poem. To Rosa. Like one who trusts to summer skies and puts his little bark to sea, is he who, lured by smiling eyes, consigns his simple heart to thee. For fickle is the summer wind, and sadly may the bark be tossed, for thou art sure to change thy mind, and then the wretched heart is lost. End of poem. To Phyllis. Phyllis, you little rosy rake, that heart of yours I long to rifle. Come, give it me, and do not make so much ado about a trifle end of poem song mary i believed thee true mary i believed thee true and i was blessed in thus believing but now i mourn that ere i knew a girl so fair and so deceiving fare thee well few have ever loved like me yes 
I have loved thee too sincerely, and few have e'er deceived like thee. Alas, deceived me too severely. Fare thee well, yet think a while on one whose bosom bleeds to doubt thee, who now would rather trust that smile and die with thee than live without thee. Fare thee well, I'll think of thee. Thou leavest me many a bitter token, for see, distracting woman, see, my peace is gone, my heart is broken, fare thee well. End of poem Song Nay, do not weep, my fanny dear. Nay, do not weep, my fanny dear, while in these arms you lie. This world hath not a wish, a fear, that ought to cost that eye a tear, that heart one single sigh. The world, ah, Fanny, love must shun the paths where many rove, one bosom to recline upon, one heart to be his only one, are quite enough for love what can we wish that is not here between your arms and mine is there on earth a space so dear as that within the happy sphere two loving arms entwine for me there's not a lock of jet adown your temples curled within those glossy tangling net my soul doth not at once forget all all this worthless world tis in those eyes so full of love my only worlds i see let but their orbs in sunshine move and earth below and skies above may frown or smile for me end of poem this recording is in the public domain